So this was 84, 85. I, I want to say it was 85 because I don't remember if at four years old, I was that cognizant of listening to music and talking to, to my grandmother on the phone while laying on the couch. But the picture I sent you is basically a version of that. It's me. Yeah. Basically looks like I'm screaming on the telephone in this really, really weird eighties striped red, blue and black shirt. Oh God. Yes. Do not. I don't care who you are, folks. If you have kids, do not put them in horizontal stripes. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. so yeah born in the usa and yes now you know after all this time i know what that song means and i'm like oh crap maybe we shouldn't have been looking up to this thing <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Set Lusting Bruce, your podcast all about Bruce Springsteen, his music, and mostly his fans. I am your host, Jesse Jackson, and joining me is a frequent guest. Uh, either he's joining me on my podcast or I am joining him on his podcast. Right before we hit record, we were trying to decide... Where does Mike sit on my most common guest? And he'd have to be uh, in the top echelon, no matter how you slice it. Uh, Mike, welcome back to Set Lusting Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's great to be back. Nobody's going to beat Mr. Smith. Yeah, that's true. You know, <laughs> you guys it, are like you guys are like two peas in a pod. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's been really uh you know, I was just as you're talking about, you're one of my first B side guests. I think uh, I am the exact first B, other than Terry. I think I am the first B side guest, other than, cause, you know. Because you, know. you talked about Daryl Hall and John Oates yep. very early 2016. Yeah. And uh, so you were, yeah, it, you were on episode six. January 14th, 2016. So um that is that's that's a way back, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things have changed since then. <sighs> but what hasn't changed is our great friendship. So absolutely. I am so glad you're here. Uh so tonight. Uh, we're going to talk Springsteen, which is kind of funny because <laughs> we, we, talked, we talked Tom Zoller, yep. we talked Nickelback, we've talked, um, you know, just general music. We've talked Daryl Hall and John Oates. Um, and you sent me a message, you know, you know, all the times we've been here, I've never talked to Bruce. And I said, you haven't. <laughs> so uh, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar uh please uh tell my guests a little about yourself oh how does this elevator pitch stuff go i don't like pitching elevators they're too heavy <laughs> and they're not really made of metal either yes so all right i am mike blanchard online i go by tfg1 mike it's all one word tfg are all capitalized the number one and then capital m i k e for those that don't know, the TFG1 stands for Transformers Generation 1. Early in my, I've been podcasting for, well, coming this December, depending on when you release this, because you are, don't try to rival me for podcasting, <laughs> Mr. Every, what in the hell's wrong with you? Like, yeah. come on, don't, do, yeah, you like, I'm, I'm, I'm an old greasy wheel now at this point, <laughs> but uh but I've been doing this for 14 years and early in the, in the, in the lifespan of my podcasting career, along with my buddy, Steve Megatron, we started the geek cast radio network in 2000, June of 2009. And someone somewhere said, what is the TFG one stand? Like, apparently they didn't even know, they didn't know that we talked transformers and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And they said, and I'm, I'm 
I'm sorry, listeners, but I have to, I have to, I can't bleep this because it, it's just too damn good. So Transformers Generation 1, 1984, ran for four, technically three seasons and then three episodes for the fourth season plus Transformers the movie. Somebody thought it stood for the fucking great one. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think I'm, I'm that self-absorbed. <laughs> <laughs> so i've been doing this for 14 years almost and i love doing it i do audio podcasts i don't do this whole newfangled video thing that's been around for a number mm-hmm. of years. I, I i can't concentrate on it like i know i know podcasts as audio podcasts and over the last 14 years we've done i think i'd have to have my math guy do the math because I, I don't do I don't do math. It's just not good. Math is hard. Yeah, it, it it's it's very very difficult. So I believe I have done just over. I'm gonna say three thousand released podcasts, mm. not counting crap that I've recorded that has yeah. gone to the crapper. Um, and the <laughs> in that time we have been able to interview a number of people, mostly voice actors and other people and things like that. And I, I've had the chance to talk to so many people that I never thought I'd have the chance to talk to. Yeah. Uh, and it's just been so fun. Do you, what, why did talk to me about starting when, you know, I know you've talked about this before, but mm-hmm. when did you start doing podcasting and and why did it become such a passion for you so at the time i i was a huge radio kid we all were radio kids you know us you know sure us little young whippersnappers that were born in the 80s and not in the 50s uh hi terry Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know uh, we grew up on the radio we grew up listening to morning shows or afternoon shows or say what you will about the woman or whatever she does in her personal life but delilah after dark or not all that stuff and everything else Mm -hmm. and i'm originally from massachusetts uh kingston massachusetts which is just depending on traffic is just an hour south of boston and yes i can still pack the car (laughs) uh and i listened to morning radio all my life and i always wanted to do that i always wanted to be that one of those people in that morning booth and i every town i ever lived in over the last 40 something years i followed whatever morning show that i got attached to wherever i ended up living and just really really enjoyed morning radio and in 2006 i found like i was trying to find because by 2006 the internet had gotten to a point where it's like, oh, and of course it doesn't, I mean, it helps that, you know, you have the late, great Steve Jobs standing on stage. Mm-hmm. This is an iPod, uh, an iPod. Yeah. This is this, the podcast, pod, you know, all that, yeah. the the reveal of the, the whatever. So, you know, I wanted to be able to listen to my homes. Like I've lived a ton of places. I've stayed in a ton of places. I've had apartments in various cities and states and whatever mm-hmm. else over the, my lifetime, but Massachusetts is always home. Just okay. like New Jersey is probably always home for Bruce, whether he currently lives there or not, you know, whatever it is, what it is, yeah. but like, that's your home, you know? And I wanted to f- be able to listen to my home morning show. And I went online and they were like, oh, well, we have a podcast version of the show in case you're like, oh, podcast. But OK, mm-hmm. iTunes, because at that time I was using iTunes for music and movies and yeah. TV shows and things like that. I'm like, oh, podcast. So I started listening and then I started branching out and then I started finding other podcasts. And I started finding other things and other things. And I listened to this one podcast called World's Finest Podcast. It was done by Michael David Sims and James Doe. They reviewed every single episode of all of the DC animated universe cartoons. So that's Batman, the animated series, which is 30 years old this year, Superman, the animated series, Batman beyond justice league, teen Titans, justice league unlimited, all that, all that superhero cartoon stuff that happened from 1992 to 2006. Sure. 
so that was a hundred episodes and by i don't know episode 20 i was like i could do this and at the time i had a job where i grew up in in my teen years i ended up in states custody in kentucky this is a whole long drawn out we, we'll be here for i'm going to condense this but from 1995 to 1999 I was a ward of the state of Kentucky because of family issues and other things and whatever else. And oh, crap, where was I going with this? So, you know, going back to that, you know, in 2003, 2004, one of the places I was still in, even though I was an adult at that point, I was 23, 24 years old, they were starting their HUD program, which is basically a permanent housing program. You can stay in it for the rest of your life. You pay a percentage of the rent, whatever it is. And I had nothing but time on my hands because I, uh, I was born with cerebral palsy on my right side. Little did I know, and I'm going to jump ahead here just a little bit only to bring it up. Little did I know how much cerebral part of the cerebral, I forgot cerebral palsy is a brain thing for the most part, even though my right hand and foot are smaller than my left hand and foot and they turn in slightly. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of brain things that go along with it. And sure. in 2019, apparently I was about to die. Not trying to bury the lead on that one, am I? Yeah. So <laughs> what happened was at that time, I believe, was it uh, Tim Conway had just passed? Literally, like it was like the week before I went to see the doctor. Tim Conway had just passed of hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is excess yeah. spinal fluid on the brain. The doctor said, if you don't go into surgery on Monday, your brain is two inches from mm. popping out of your skull. Mm. okay sure fine all as they did was they put in a drain and they drained out the excess fluid i do not have robot parts in me yet as much as i am a transformers fan i don't have robot parts in me yet much to your sadness right <laughs> well i don't know because having to have to take care of a shunt i don't know what the i don't know what that entails yeah. and i i don't want to know but it worked. I'm semi okay. The headaches still come back and, and everything else. But, but yeah, so I, the whole point, the whole point of saying all this about the disability stuff is I can't work a normal job. Right. I tried when I was younger, when I was, you know, just out of high school and I tried college and college didn't work because my brain just couldn't back then. For, I don't know what it's like today, but back then in the late nineties, early two thousands, no matter what you went to college for, yeah. you had to, a, a course requirement was you had to have and pass a mathematics course that was beyond basic, like addition. It was like yeah. algebra, calculus, and, and, and Romulan all, all in one or whatever. I, I know Romulan isn't, isn't it's, it's a Star Trek, but whatever. Yeah. So I just, I couldn't do it. And I tried working at fast food places and other places and I got, I was fine doing those jobs, whatever. And I can probably do one of those jobs now, but I just, I just can't. So yeah. at the time in 2004, I was in this HUD program. They were about to announce new, what they call live in residence, which is basically just a person that lives in whichever, like the apartment building or the complex or whatever, mm -hmm that just yeah. check, checks on people at night when the main staff isn't there, that kind of thing. So I was a part of, I was a resident of the program. And then they were like, oh, would you like to be the, the live-in? I'm like, okay, sure. So basically I had to give up my HUD spot, which I don't know what my life would be like if I had never done that, but that's a whole other what if scenario. So they're like, yeah, you'd have to give up your HUD spot, but we'll give you a stipend. We'll do this. We'll do that. Blah, blah, blah. So I did that from 2005 to 2010. So during this time, I found podcasts and I started listening to podcasts. And because I had all my days free, I only had to really work at night. I could, you know, listen to as many podcasts as I wanted to. And this guy, Michael David Sims, who as of this recording, I have just uh, a couple months ago, I just actually, I just released it, or I'm about to release it, depending on when this comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, I finally, after 14 years of talking to him and, and listening to his, I finally got to interview him on my show. So that, that was awesome. That's cool. 
but you know, he sent me, you know, email advice about at the time audacity and, and recording and this, that, and the other thing. Mm-hmm. And I just sat down and I recorded myself. And at first I thought, and luckily I, I don't have to preface this, but at first I thought I was the, the first guy before Adrian comes into good morning Vietnam today in the Northwest, there's going to be winds out of the East or whatever, you know, that, that, that first, radio guy that was given the weather report in that movie i thought you had to sound a specific way on the radio on podcast or whatever like i didn't really realize i could just have the personality that i have Mm -hmm. etc 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 so the first nine ten episodes they're just i'm green i'm greener than a a, an ear of corn before it goes yellow at the time so yeah and and i think all of us are that way i mean when we start podcasting it is you know we're all trying to figure out what to do and how do you say this and so yeah i mean i that is not surprisingly right it is right. we're all trying to figure it out what is your main podcast now for my listeners oh boy we have so many so <laughs> so your network why don't you just say your network yes it's the geekcast radio network it is geekcastradio.com over the 13 and a half years the network has been online it'll be 14 years for the network coming up in june of next year it we have we have everything because i didn't i wanted every show to be its own feed so pe- like if people wanted movie talk they could go to the movie show if they wanted cartoons yeah. they could go to the comic etc etc et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. so you know we have pretty much anything and everything and like i said after 14 years of, of content we have so much stuff uh, yeah. currently i am doing the pull bag which is the comic book review and discussion show that show is about to hit 10 years next year in March. I'm also doing Toycast, which is our toy discussion podcast, which uh, that came back uh, in 2021 with a slightly new format. And we do other just general geek stuff. All right. So, all right, we're here to talk Bruce. So yeah. tell me your earliest reflection of hearing Springsteen music. And I know you've done some homework. Like you, <laughs> oh, yes. you sent me kind of a, a your Springsteen timeline. So let's let's go into it, my friend. Yes, absolutely. My Springsteen timeline is very short. <laughs> my life story is very long. My Springsteen's timeline is very short. <laughs> so you know, in the eighties, we were listening to the radio. We were listening to cassettes at the time or, or, or records. You know, if I, I don't remember, no, I don't know. I remember the Hall and Oates records. I do not remember any Bruce records, but I do remember having born in the USA on cassette tape. I do remember having, we are the world on, on, on cassette tape and, and all of that. And I believe I sent you this picture. It is of me. It's not the picture I thought it was. Like, I have a picture somewhere. It's in some photo album. I have to find it, whatever. But basically, what I used to do is, in the background, I would have Born in the USA on, basically, cassette repeat, whatever the hell that was back at the time. And I would have that have the music on low while I was talking to my grandmother. And at the time, I was in a Born in the USA t-shirt. Mm-hmm. So this was 84, 85. I, I want to say it was 85 because I don't remember if at four years old, I was that cognizant of listening to music and talking to, to my grandmother on the phone while laying on the couch. But the picture I sent you is basically a version of that. It's me. Yeah. Basically looks like I'm screaming on the telephone in this really, really weird eighties striped red blue and black shirt oh god yes do not i don't care who you are folks if you have kids do not put them in horizontal stripes <laughs> uh, so yes. so yeah born in the usa and yes now you know after all this time i know what that song means and I'm like, oh crap maybe we shouldn't have been looking up to this thing <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a very patriotic song. It's it just is. not patriotic in the way that we that thought a lot of people think. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what is your next remembrance of Bruce? When 
as you're reaching musical, you're no longer a toddler, you're, you're finding your own musical journey when, as an adult or a teenager, what is the next you remember running into Bruce? So before that, I have to just say that was sure. born in the USA in 8485. 8485 was born in the USA. And I know Santa Claus, I know he released Santa Claus in 81, but I was one years old at that point. But okay. all as I remember from that is Santa going to get you a new saxophone. Babe. Like I, I know mm. the song, but like the one line that sticks out to me is about the damn saxophone. And then he yeah. shows up and we are the world. And it's the only time to my knowledge that he and the Hall and Oates guys have ever worked together. Right. So that's the 80s. After that, time skips from 85 to 96. Okay. And I start seeing these trailers for this Tom Cruise movie. Say what you will about Tom Cruise. Say what you will about his... I don't give a... Cr- that's the thing, Jesse. When we were kids in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, yeah. 80s, whatever, we cared about the content. We cared about the fictional universe. Nobody gave a crap mm-hmm. about the personal lives we cared about the characters that these people were creating for us yeah so i started seeing trailers up for jerry Maguire, and one of the trailers had this at the time new bruce springsteen song called secret garden yeah one of these trailers and how it's interspersed is it has the song and it has it mixed in with them you know her saying things him saying things and i just absolutely love that i thought that was great yeah uh jerry Maguire, secret garden Mm-hmm. yep yeah uh so tom cruise not tom hanks no i said tom cruise did you yeah did i said you? tom yeah okay because right. you know he, he's make he's, an edit yes no it's okay yeah no 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 <laughs> he's a you know weird yes he is yeah. weird now uh but um i still love his movie so i do <laughs> i, I just don't like, care i'm like uh, okay. it's the fiction it's, yeah, yeah it is just yeah he's uh you know um his rinse repeat time movie i you know mm-hmm. i i can never remember it's a horrible title but one of the best science fiction movies in a long time what yeah. year did it come out do you remember um this is fascinating um it's the tomorrow movie oh um, uh, yeah. yeah 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 i i know i know what you're talking about i can't think of it yeah off the top because of my head. he uh so- he keeps repeating mm-hmm. the day over and over again it's groundhog day and uh yeah it's yeah um, yeah yeah. okay edge of tomorrow edge of tomorrow that's what it is yes yes a really really well done movie yeah i I haven't i need i probably should check that out yeah you'll like it it's really good very cool very cool so i'm like okay i haven't really thought about bruce since i was five six seven years old in the 80s and all of a sudden i hear his vocals on this tom cruise i'm like wait what Mm -hmm. oh cool but I wasn't really following it. I just yeah. heard the song and I liked it. That's the thing. Like back then in the eighties and nineties, it was all about singles and this, that, and the other thing and everything mm-hmm. else and all that. So, mm-hmm. so that's, that's the nineties. Do you, um, did, did you see Jerry McGuire and, and oh, yeah. hear that and saw how the song worked for it? Oh yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, did you like the song on top of it just because of being in the movie? Oh yeah, or, no, yeah. absolutely. Well, you know, that's the thing. Like, what grabbed me from the trailer was that, like, again, I had moved on musically to other things. I, and the funny thing is, in 1993, I ended up moving to from Massachusetts to Kentucky. Okay, mm-hmm. and at that time in the 90s, big country was just Reba and Garth and Brooks and Dunn and all like yeah. all these up and comer country. So my thinking is, oh my God, Louisville, Kentucky only has country music. I can't. There, there are no other radio stations. That's all they have here. What in the hell is going on? Sure. So you know, I was I was way out of the 80s phase. I I like so when when secret garden came up i was like oh cool i need to hear this on the radio or i need to get the cassette or i need to do this or do that i love the song i think the song is great i think it's amazing i think it works for the movie and i think it works on its own as well yeah it really did Mm -hmm. um and and i do agree it is one of those um it i because it wasn't on an album it was for the film but it was it was a great use of the film mm-hmm. and i agree with you i remember 
uh, on the radio playing the mix that had the dialogue mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, that was kind of cool. Uh, because yes. of course I remember, and cause I'm older than you <laughs> during the, during the seventies, you would have, you would have like talking songs that you'd have a fake announcer interviewing someone mm -hmm. and the song would be clips yeah popular songs that you know kind of told the story so i like that all right so we got that what what came next in next your journey? is <laughs> we fast forward a decade wow if you can believe it i can 1996 to 2006 now technically this show started in 2003 but the episode that features nine bruce springsteen songs and one song that we will talk about in a moment mm -hmm. but uh there are 10 songs there's a tv show on cbs at the time called cold case with uh um Catherine morris and tom tom berry and jeremy ratchford and uh tracy toms is in it and john finn it, it's mm -hmm. your standard you know at that time case I mean, of the week yeah, it, it's your standard police procedural kind of yeah. thing. But the cool thing about this show is, like, most of these police procedurals are in Boston, or not Boston. Um, I mean, some of them are, but most of them are in New York or LA or this yeah. or that or whatever. This was in Philadelphia. To ah. my not, now I'm, I'm sure there are other TV shows, but in my personal TV watching history, I have only ever really seen two shows that hail from Philadelphia it's Cold Case and Boy Meets World. And Cold yeah. Case was interesting because they presented going back in time. And one of the reasons why Cold Case has never been on DVD, even though I believe it's on streaming on HBO Max, because I, I remember rewatching it on HBO Max, but mm -hmm. it's never been on DVD because the show had all of these songs that needed the music rights to, blah, 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 you know, to whatever to yeah. do, to physical cut, whatever, all that. And they pick songs that, like, they, they do 1942, 1957, 1962, 1977, 84, 85, you know, 90s. Hell, they'll do a couple that are, like, three months before the, the, the current timeline or whatever. And it's just such a good show. that you, It's a show that uses music unlike any other show at that point in time that I had ever seen before. And, see, and, and the premise, right, is they are exactly what it says cold cases yeah. they are exploring cold cases so mm -hmm. and one of the best ways to present an image and that persona not only is in costuming yeah you know and, and how they're dressed and and you know um the scenery yeah like uh you know automobiles is by music mm-hmm and I did not know this. And so this is something you have taught me. <laughs> there was an episode that may have an interest to certain Springsteen fans. Yes. This is from season three. It is episode 11. It is called Eight Years. I'm going to read the brief little description and then i'm going to and then i'm going to list all the songs okay four close high school friends each went their separate ways in 1988 years later in 1988 one of them was murdered the homicide team receives a tip about the murder prompting a reinvestigation of the case and an examination of the friends lives hopes and dreams after high school okay so like I said, this this episode has nine songs. It has ten songs, but nine of them are all Bruce. Wow. So and, and I and you have ahead. a list ready for us, right? Yep. I have a list ready and I have the scenes uh for each of these. And people like I said, people can go on to HBO Max and watch this one. This aired January. Nice. Okay. Yeah, it aired January eighth, uh, two thousand nine, I said twenty sixteen, two thousand six. The first song as the opening of the, the high school seniors drive down the road is No Surrender. Mm -hmm. The second one, which, because before part of my research and being on this episode of, of your lovely podcast here was, and this is something we'll talk about a little bit later, is I wanted to listen to the Born in the USA album again. 
because mm-hmm. there are a number of songs on there that I either don't remember listening to or just never listened to. Yeah. And the second song that is featured in this episode is Bobby Jean. Okay. When I started, this is what prompted this whole research into Cole. I'm like, wait a minute. Wasn't, didn't, wasn't there an episode of, so that's what prompted. I started listening. I'm like, Bobby Jean, I, I remember looking at it on the on the on the Spotify listing. I'm like, have I heard that before? Because the al- the song title I didn't really remember. So I started listening. I'm like, I've heard this before. Where? Oh, right. It was in Cold Case. So that was the second song. Uh, the characters of Clem and May say goodbye wow. with a wedding in the background. Uh, May asks Clem to leave with her. The next one is Brilliant Disguise. In this scene at Clem and Sally's wedding, Petey gets mad. Then we have, for the next scene, we have Glory Days. Clem tells Petey that it's uh, his marriage is basically breaking apart. So, you know, hey, break out the Glory Days. Mm-hmm. Scene after that is I'm on fire. Sally sits home alone waiting for Clem. He comes home late. And then we get uh, Drive All Night for the next one. Clem drives May from her mom's funeral to the reception, but she tells him to just keep driving when she sees him. All those old feelings keep coming back. Mm -hmm. After that is Stolen Car. Clem hot wires a car with Petey. It's a Clem. It's a flashback that Clem is reflecting on his life. But hello, Stolen Car. He's hot wiring. He's stealing a car. Like, not even gone in 60 seconds what was that spot on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> After that is Atlantic City, where Petey and Henry slash Mac chase down Clem. May's waiting in a hotel for Clem to get her. Uh, the last Bruce song was One Step Up, where May left the road after being shot, and she stays next to Clem's body. Sally gives Lily flowers from her shop. Lily's, Lily flashbacks to her motorcycle guy. May goes back to the casino. So those are all the Bruce songs, and those are the nine tracks that are featured throughout this episode, and that brings us to the end of the episode. Now, I was expecting to them to use some other Bruce song or whatever else, and the only reason why I am bringing this up, and I'm not meaning to bring them up on every episode of your show that I'm on, but, but somehow... But you need to, yeah. I don't need to. It's not a it's not a necessity for me, but they just... Dip, Nick, Nickelback and Bruce Springsteen apparently go hand in hand because... yes. The last track on this is Far Away, and apparently the, the website that I'm using, Tune, uh, TuneFind, does not have a, a specific scene description for... It's basically the end credit song as, as, as yeah. the episode closes. So, so yeah, I, I had forgotten about this episode. I mean, I remembered. I recently just watched it, I don't know, a couple of years ago. But I was like, oh, right. I need to find that again. And I, I just, I love that, that there's a television show out there that at least one episode has nine Bruce songs all in yeah. a row. That's awesome. That That is awesome. I, I did not know that. And now I will have to go and yep. watch that episode. That is greatness. Yes. Uh, all right. So um, the last thing really quick, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, no, no, no. The, the other thing, uh, the reason why the, the Nickelback connection I don't. Ah, when was that ticket? I have to see if I can. I know I have a picture. So, in 2006, my mom and I, first time ever going for me, like I had been listening to Nickelback since late '99, early 2000. Yeah. And it was always back then. It was like, oh, pick your poison, Creed or Nickelback. You can pick one or the other, or you can pick both and be fan of. I was always a fan of both, and then I ended mm-hmm. up. I'm more in the Nickelback camp than the Creed camp because Creed kind of went down the toilet, but it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, but in 2006, my mom was like, oh, they're going to be in Louisville, Kentucky at Freedom Hall. Let's go. Here we go. I'm buying you tickets to go see Nickelback. And I'm like, okay, this is 2006. I would have been 26. Yeah, 26 years old. I go to this con. We go to the concert. I I remember them singing How You Remind Me. I remember them singing Hangnail. Uh-huh. Every, everyone knows How You Remind Me. It was the lead single and the, basically they're one of their biggest hits off of so, the 2001 album Silver Side Up. Hangnail is another song off of there. But by the end of this show, and I didn't realize this, that, that the smoke that they were using wasn't just regular, you know, pyro smoke. 
-hmm. it was the other kind of smoke and i had a contact high at 26 i I, i've never done drugs my entire life right i I was a dare kid i i knew to stay away from that crap right i had the biggest contact high and i'm like mom we just need to get home instead of saying punch the pedal i kept telling her to punch the pencil because i couldn't get i couldn't get the the contact high out of my system but it was such a fun experience and it was so so very very cool to to see that band live oh that's awesome that that is great Mm -hmm. yeah um did um what what's next you 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 mentioned that you've got some others Right. Well, n- next is it pretty much drops off after that, other than, mm-hmm. you know, finding your lovely podcast in 2016, talking to you for the first time, kind of looking into Bruce here and there. Yeah. And then, you know, you were a- a- as you should, because you are, you know, the Bruce Springsteen podcast here with Set Lusting yeah. Bruce. You're blasting everything all over 2020 about Letter to You. So I'm like, okay, I'll check out the album. I liked the album, but I don't remember. I remember listening to it. I don't remember any of the tracks, and I did not have time to prepare to listen yeah, to no, it no, again no, no, before, no. before yeah. this. And then the last, uh, the now, last. Go ahead. Have you have you heard any of the cover album? Yes, and I didn't re- like. Didn't all speak is to I, you? No, well, no, like I. All as I knew is I saw you tweeting and I saw you posting on Facebook about it. And I was like, oh, a new Bruce album. Okay. And that's all I knew. And I went and I went to listen to it. And it wasn't yeah. until one of the, I don't even know what the track was, but it wasn't until the one, one of the later tracks. That, I'm like, holy crap, this is a cover out. Ah. <laughs> I was expect like, it's two years, technically three Three, yeah. two, three years later, I was expecting a new Bruce album. I was expecting something else from him. I was not expecting Bruce Springsteen to break out the covers. Mm-hmm. And it's not that I dislike it. I just kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, you're trying to say something to the teacher and she goes, wah, 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 wah. Yeah. I, okay. I can see that. Uh, yeah. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's <laughs> it's okay. Um, what when you when you listen to them, does it speak any way to you at all? Um, do you do you just kind of intellectually go, oh, that's interesting, and then move on? His songs in general, or or the cover album? Just his songs in general. A lot of his songs speak to me. I. So today, as of this, as we're recording this, yeah, I have had "Born in the USA" on repeat all day long in album order, cover mm-hmm. to cover. Yeah, and I love the album. It's I've always loved the album. It's it's great. I needed mm-hmm. obviously I had to rediscover it because there, were, like I said, there were a lot of songs I didn't. I like. Everybody remembers working on the highway. Everybody remembers I'm on fire. Like I said, I did not remember Bobby Jean, and I didn't remember one of the other yeah. tracks. But but I mean, I love it. I every time I hear those first notes of his version of Santa, Claus, I'm like, oh, it's Christmas time. Let's go. Like, yeah. Let's let's get the Christmas stuff out. Every time I hear Secret Garden, I remember Jerry Maguire, but I still love that song on its own as a romantic song for whomever whatever in in general so no i absolutely love his songs i i love his music and i think it's great i just don't like i don't have the connection that you have or that terry has where it's been with you your whole lives whereas for me that's hall and oats that's this that's that whatever it is but i still have we wouldn't i wouldn't have asked you to do this episode sure absolutely you know like if i didn't have some sort of connection to him and the funny thing about connections is ever since, and I, I say this, I have to tell the story every time. Yeah. Uh, I don't, was it 2016, 27, whenever Terry started the, his show, mm-hmm. I forget when it was, but I think it was 20, whenever it was, 
you had sent me a, a message on Facebook or a direct message on Twitter, like, oh, check this out. And I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, no, I know what it was. You invited me to like the page on Facebook. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll like it. And I'll, ch-. it was one of those yeah. in passing moments. It wasn't like I was trying to ignore you or just, yeah, what the, huh, this. No, it wasn't. It was just like, oh, okay. And I'll get to it when I get to it. So yeah. I, finally, I finally got to it and I finally jumped on board. And ever since then, I have been finding these various music podcasts. And one I've found recently over the last, I think, year or so is called Records Revisited. Yeah. And they basically kind of do what we did with H2O. They go, you know, track by track. They rate the, you know, they they, they, they have their own scoring system and everything else. Well, in episode 191 of their show, they did Born in the USA. Ah. And John Latham, yes, John Latham was their guest on that episode. He has this amazing thing that I will have you put in right here. And and you're talking about this being a pop song. This is definitely Bruce's most popular song ever this is the highest charting song that that he that he ever had so he's never had a number one hit yep and it's the most out of place on this record for several reasons um first of all um everything else on this record was was written and and up to this point i think it's important to note that this song didn't exist until after bruce thought the record was complete Right. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty well documented story at this time, but like it was an 11th song record. And in truth, that record, I think, would have probably been a better encapsulation of some of the themes that Bruce said he was going for with it. But then you have this song, which is just the oddest of odd ducks, um, written out of spite, basically, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, my record's done. John Landau says, no, it isn't. So Bruce, in a fit of rage, goes and writes this in 10 minutes. And uh, <laughs> it's the most it's the most non-indicative song by, yes. you know, kind of a legendary artist. It's the one, but for a song that's a hit by a legendary artist, this one is the most non-indicative of everything else that that artist does. You know, like, I can't think of another song by another, like, legendary artists that they had like their big hit and their big hit sounds nothing else like anything they ever did. There's not even a guitar track on this track. You know, it's all synths. It's gated drum sounds. And Clarence. And, Don't forget Clarence. And Clarence, <clears throat> unless you have the 12 inch single version of Dancing in the Dark, which has the most horrible God forsaken dance remix is the B side. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard it. You're Stay a young away. man. Don't don't do it, Ben. You're Stay a young away. man. You have so much to live for. You have so much to live for. Don't do it. Um, I would re- You would rather listen to Working on the Highway. That's that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but I know that this is a big song for a lot of people. I know it is. So I know it's very. Uh, controversial to some for me to just sit here and kind of dog it, but I dog it within the context of the record. And this is the one part of the record where I feel like the sequencing was messed up. I honestly think if you had to put Dancing in the Dark on this record to sandwich it between one of the most, one of the more uh, kind of universal rocking singles and one of the most beautifully stoic and poignant album closers of all time. It just, it doesn't fit there. It was such a big single. And I believe, was this the first single from the record? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. So as the first single, if I was, the, if I was the A&R guy and they were doing the sequencing thing, the way I would have played this is, man, it's a weird spot to put it between glory days and my hometown. But you're starting off, and and it's a weird place to put it for people who are just buying the record because they want that song. Give the audience what they want and don't screw with your sequencing. Let this be the starter for side two. Play Dancing in the Dark at the beginning of side two. You got your hit out of the way. 
and then you can go back to what you were doing with because think about it this way if you take dance in the dark out of the picture put that at the top of side two check out this sequencing and how awesome it would be no surrender bobby jean i'm going down glory days my hometown even though i'm going down is kind of a weak sauce song it's still indicative of the springsteen sound so you're getting a springsteen song you got a sax solo in there but otherwise you've got it's almost all killer, no filler for the rest of that record. And you don't have this weird synth ridden dance song in the middle of it. Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's my tirade on dancing in the dark. It's just that where it was in the album, it fits in an odd spot. I think it breaks the sequencing in a bad spot. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I scored this one so damn low. All right. Um, Wayne, anything before I give you a fun fact? Yeah, I, I, you know what? This song has grown on me over time, but I agree with a, a lot of what he said. This, I mean, it was even part of it was image. I mean, that scruffy, you know, not shaven Bruce Springsteen wearing almost what looked like dirty clothes. Uh, it was all changed. He was buff. He was wearing tight jeans. He's got, you know, his hair's cut. And and now he's it it also it also a lot reminds me of Hungry Heart in the sense of that that prior to that Hungry Heart was his biggest hit, and this feels very. When I heard that it was written, someone said you need to write one more song, and he's like, I'm not going to do it, and they're like, Oh, I don't hear a single, and f you, uh, write I'll fine, I'll write a song, and he writes one very similar in a lot of ways to his biggest hit to that point. Um, it's grown on me over time. But I, if yeah, I agree that it's in the weirdest spot. Like, Glory Days ties in so good with my hometown, which that's also nostalgic, but it's not as happy. And so it's a real great contradiction. So this should definitely be moved out of in between there. Yes. But here's the deal when you're talking about sequencing from the 80s, think about where artists put their filler songs. It is on side B, typically either last song or second to last song. So just think about where he thought <laughs> this song belonged. But see, I don't know. Maybe I'm I, reading into it, but I don't buy into that because, like, okay, what's the biggest Cindy Lauper song there is? Girls just want to have fun. That was track two, side one on She's So Unusual. Right after money changes everything, it fits perfectly where it is. Um, yeah. So you've got that uh, thriller. You know, he he front loaded a bulk of that record on that one. You know, yep. Um, that side A closer. Yep, side A close, side A closer. But it, I believe beat it's on side one. Am I not mistaken? One. It's on side two. Oh, want to be starting something is the starting track. That is the starting track, yep. you know. Um, so you know, so front loading it, or even just like, um, do y'all remember a band called the Hooters from that time period? Nervous <laughs> Night, yeah. Vince Rigo. You know, yes, we do. We okay. had Eric Bazilian from the Hooters on last year. Oh my God, what an honor! Um, yes. And we and we danced. One of the best songs of the eighties. Fantastic. I believe it was track one, side one. They knew what they had. Uh, yes. in, in excess, listen like thieves. What you need? First single, first track on the album. Um, let's see. I mean, the list of the '80s. I, I think it was just a matter of. I, it was just a matter of bad sequencing, you know. But I'm saying where he, where I think where he thought this song belonged was buried on side two. Now the A R N R guys. They're like, we hear the single and we like this, therefore we're going to release it. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Springsteen's call was to bury it. He doesn't want that to be the the highlight. I get what you're saying. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. However, if in the midst of the thing, the A&R people are already saying, we think Dancing in the Dark is going to be the lead single. At that point, the conversation so I need – if I was Springsteen, like if it was me and I wrote this song that I don't even really give a damn about and I have all those other songs that like tie into what I was trying to say and it's like, yeah. well, we want that to be the single anyway. 
we'll start side two off with it. Let me get back to what I was doing. Right. Boom. You know, yeah. either that or front load it and put it right before cover me. Do Born in the USA, go dance in the dark track two, and then the rest of the sequence would still work. Because you got the you got the two, you, you got the opener, and then you got dance in the dark right there off the top. Get it out of the way. But uh putting it right before my hometown, that has always rubbed me wrong. <laughs> that is always listening to the record in sequence, that has always just been like the Man, uh, you know, we were on such a great ride, and all of a sudden, yeah. somebody we we let the asshole in the back decided what we were going to listen to on the radio. Great, you know. Well, you know what? D despite how we might feel of this as being, you know, the outlier, um, the Grammy Awards felt differently. He won his first Grammy for this for best male rock performance. I think it was. Um, he beat out David Bowie for Blue Jean, Billy Idol's Rebel Yell, Elton John's Restless, and Pink Houses from John Mellencamp. Pink Houses is a better Springsteen song than Dancing in the Dark. <laughs> there I said, like. <laughs> By the way, when Mike and I were talking, I had not heard this clip that I had just played, and he sent it to me after the fact. Don't know if I agree with the guys. Don't want to. So that's why I don't address this directly to Mike. Um, I think it's an interesting take, but I'm pretty happy with Born in the USA the way it came out. Anyway, back to my discussion with Mike. So I listened to that, and I was okay. like, let me see if like let me take that suggestion so what he suggested as people would have just heard is if you take dancing in the dark and put it as track one of side b so you have and i i created a a, a playlist on spotify born in the usa the right way okay so you have I'm on fire is the final track of side a you have dancing in the dark starting for side B instead of no surrender. And then the final listing for the end of that is no surrender, Bobby Jean, I'm going down glory days in my hometown. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound better? So what I've been doing all day today is yes. Originally in the morning today, I listened to the original album, the way it, the way they did the original sequencing mm -hmm. and then i've been listening to my playlist all damn day long and i'm like i can't get this out of my head look i don't want i don't want to tell the creator of this thing. i don't want to tell mr springsteen like you did this wrong or your people did that no i'm just saying years later you know almost four we are a year and a half away from the 40th anniversary of this album 84 right yeah yes yeah, yeah, yeah. okay yeah said so to make sure so you know, but I love the way this, this, you know, putting dancing as side B track one, I love how it just makes the album flow a mm -hmm. lot, a lot more cleanly. That's, that's interesting that you, that you, you think that, you know, <laughs> that, that, no, no, no. I mean, and, and I do think there are, um, you know, there's certain something to be said about, right, that this is um, because when it's in order, it's why sometimes when you hit shuffle, mm -hmm. you go, oh, wait, wait, that's that kind of that song doesn't come after this. And you yep. hearing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tells you, um, you know, some interesting things. So, no, I think I think that's interesting. You know, Terry does that a lot. And those <laughs> Uh, obviously you should be listening to Terry Smith who does music talks, which is one of Mike and I's favorite mutual podcasts. We've both mm -hmm. been on, um, does a great job of just, of basically having someone explain their life in terms of music, yep. uh, that it is, um, you know, it's, it's, he'll talk about like for letter to you, he would have changed a couple of songs out. And uh, so, yeah, no, I, I think this is great. Uh, this is wonderful. So um, what, 
Um, what's next for you musically? Uh, are you continuing to explore new artists and try to find new things? All right. Well, I will answer the question in like what's next, but I will say what is currently because currently okay. I, I am at next. Okay. So I believe it was you because only you would suggest, I am sure Terry would, would have suggested it too, but I'm pretty yeah. sure it was you that's, I, before this, I, I didn't listen, I, I listened to it, but I didn't like ingrain it into my brain like I did yeah. Born in the USA. Dead Man's Town, Born in the USA Revisited. Ah, yes. You, you had told me to listen to this. Yeah. And I listened to it and I'm just like, holy S, holy S, holy S, holy S, holy, like, wow, 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 wow. It's so interesting. The, and there are some that I don't like. Mm -hmm. I'm like, like, look, I know everyone including Ben and Wayne who do the records revisited podcast. They are not the biggest fans of working on the highway. Yeah. I love working on the yeah. highway because so for me, like, and again, blame Tom Cruise because in 1990, he and his then wife at the time, Nicole Kidman were in days of thunder. Yes. And at one point they went down to Darlington. Now, mm -hmm. 1990 and 1984 were not that far apart at the time. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the first thing I thought of in the Darlington, I'm like, oh, it's kind of like the Bruce Springsteen song. So Darlington County and then working on the highway. It's kind of like yes. these two. Those are a great duet. Yeah, this two back-to-back -back double shot of Bruce Springsteen. But what they do, what the the people, uh, Dead Man's Town people do with, um, I want to give credit because you always have to give credit. So Quaker City Nighthawks does Darlington County and then Blitzen Trapper. Hey, that's a holiday. Well, you're mm -hmm. going to trap some reindeer? Let's go. Let's, let's get Ben Affleck together and get some reindeer games going. Yeah. So the musical stylings on these things, and it's I know it's a revisited album. It's kind of a cover thing a little bit, but... Working on the highway to me is it's very uh, Bruce's version is very upbeat. It's a very yeah. like summertime, you know, let, let's get the steel out and, and all this and all that. This version, I'm like, oh, my God, they slowed it down. Yeah. No, so don't do for that. The, for those of you who may not be aware, uh, this was a. Um, a um, Collaborative Americana. Album. This mm -hmm. was basically a Americana group, uh, including Jason Isbell, Amanda Shires, um, Holly Williams does a great version of No Surrender, uh, Justin Towns Earl did Glory Days, uh, My Hometown by the North Mississippi All-Stars, uh, you know, as we've mentioned, a lot of people, and they totally redid the songs. They did mm -hmm. not do them and, and i do style. like some of them yeah and i do yeah. like some of them i'm not saying i don't like it i like some of them but it's just yeah there's something inherent when you hear a song where it either a cover works or it doesn't work yeah and and, and i think that's you know one of the things you want in a cover mm -hmm. is to have it be a little different Mm -hmm. and you know and they do this and some of them i agree with you i go "Ooh, that was really good and others i go eh, i kind of like the original and yeah. others it's like well i enjoy this one even though i you know this is a, a unique take on this and while i may like the original enough i really like what they did it's like example holly williams which is hank williams granddaughter um and um you know no. she she does a great version of no surrender very different than bruce's version but no surrender is one of my favorite songs so i you know i think it's cool yeah 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 well it, it is a very yeah. cool cool album so that's kind of something yeah. i've been catching up with as Good. far as what's next and what's new I just found out that Disturbed put out a new album, so I'm in the middle of listening to that. And after five years, it's been five years. You people have had a saving grace since 2017. 2017, Feed the Machine came out. Mm -hmm. It's been five years. We've had the pandemic. Most artists that I've followed my whole life are either putting, like, 2020, we're sitting at home, let's work. 
you know, yeah. let's put out an album. Let's do this. Let's do Bruce. Hello, Bruce's letter to you, you know, all that mm-hmm. and whatever else. My, my, one of my favorite, my number one favorite band, Blackstone Cherry put out uh, the human condition and five years go by and 2022 hits us. And all of a sudden, Nickelback comes back with a vengeance and they are about to get rolling. So the new Nickelback album is out and it is called Get Rolling. It is their standard 11 tracks because for some odd reason, they just love doing 11 tracks. I don't remember the original story about this. Uh, One of the main, uh, one of the first singles was called San Quentin. And Mm -hmm. the way the story goes, the way that Chad tells it is he was at Guy Fieri's birthday party and he ran into this guy and this guy's like, oh, hi, Chad. I like your stuff. Uh, Chad's like, oh, yeah. yeah, what do you do? Well, I'm the warden at San Quentin. Chad just wow. looks at him like, no, you're not. Like, oh, no. Funny. And then every all the people behind the person, they're like, no, he, he really is. He's the warden. So yeah. Chad just said, you know, the line, somebody please get me the hell out of San Quentin. And then the song rolls from there. Oh, that's um, awesome. You know, it, it's got a bunch of other cool songs on it. It's your standard, you know, Nickelback. It's got the it's got the hitters. It's got the slow ones. It's got the, you know, photographs and this, that, and everything, everything else. The one that I absolutely love, though, is track six. It's called Tidal Wave. And it's a slower song, but it just, it's just perfect. Uh, you know, as far as like this, this, you know, combining water with love and, you know, our love is like a tidal wave and it ebbs and flows and that kind of thing, whatever else. The other one I, I can't not mention because it's just, it's a 70s, 80s, it's more 80s than 70s, but it's basically, you know, it's called Those Days. And it's like, Remember those days when the when the streetlights came on and we had to be home or remember those days when, you know, we watched Elm Street when no one was home or what, you know, it's mm-hmm. all this flashback stuff. Remember when we used Star 69 and, you know, this, that, Star 69, I don't even think exists. Anymore. Does anybody no. even have a landline? You know, no, all exactly. This. But it's such a nice, like, throwback song and it's, even though people will say, oh, my God, it's Nickelback. And why has he been talking about Nickelback for so damn long? This is such a boring podcast. Uh, but the thing about this song is, I don't know if any other band could do this song. I'm sure someone else could come up with a similar thing in a different style of whatever that per- that artist is. But the way they do this, it makes me forget that it's Nickelback. But I've always loved the band, so I don't have I don't. I don't have the problem with them that apparently the rest of the world does. And I've just never understood unless Chad Kroger came to your house and hit you in the back of your head with a rock or something like, yeah, get over it. It's a rock band. They deserve the fame that they've gotten. And hell, if Deadpool can, can defend them, then they must be all right. Exactly. So good. <laughs> All right, Mike, if someone wants to reach you, what's the best way? Uh, best way usually is Twitter. Uh, it is uh, at TFG and Mike on Twitter. If you want to reach out to the podcast stuff, that is feedback at geekcastradio.com. Visit geekcastradio.com. Check out all of our content. We have got a bunch of stuff coming up in 2023. I actually, I, ha- I have to tell this story now because you'll, you'll, you'll close the podcast mm-hmm. before I get to your brother in music, Mr. Smith, uh, I, I yeah. have, I, I go to people with various things like, like you and yeah. I are going to eventually do more hollow notes stuff and whatever else right. and, and all that. And it's like, okay, that's the person I'm doing this with. Yeah. Well, I was looking to do something with, and Terry, I, I blanchard his format as he would say, I took his format and I applied it to Let's see what it what did I do? Six, yeah, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2010s, 2010s, and 2020s. So in 2019, I took his format. I chose songs from one band that wasn't even around in the earlier day, basically Blackstone Cherry. I took you know all of their songs and applied them to each decade. And I've, you know, kind of gone to him every time. I'm like, oh, I'd like to do a Blackstone Cherry thing. Would you be interested? So he's my, I'm breaking his cherry for Terry every time I, you know, do one of these things. So we just did one where we were talking about the live 
show they did over at the Royal Albert Hall in, mm-hmm. in London. They did this in 2021 and they had just released the video for it this year. And after this, actually in the middle of it, he's like, okay, Mike, you've, you've convinced me. The band's convinced me. I'm convinced next time they're, you know, near Scotland or near wherever, mm-hmm. you know, I'll, I'll go to a show. I'm like, okay, cool. Middle of the podcast, I get on their website. I look up tickets. Oh, Terry, by the way, they're going to be in Scotland in January or February of 2023. Mm -hmm. I basically talked him into buying a ticket for himself. So he's going to go and he's going to, we're going to do a report back on on his, because I got to see them in 2018. And that was awesome when when Karen was still with us and we both went and we, we, we had a blast and it was such, they're one of the best current musician bands to to see live all right yeah that sounds great i appreciate that story all right mike as always i love visiting with you we will find another excuse i'm sure there's Mm -hmm. always more tom zoller stuff to discuss yeah uh and uh hey i appreciate it listeners you stay safe let's be kind to each other we'll talk to you soon goodbye